Virginia State Parks, 75 years and still growing, is made possible in part by the generous support of the following. Alpha Natural Resources is an energy company dedicated to respecting the land and celebrates the 75th anniversary of the Virginia State Parks system. Alpha Natural Resources, we power the world through the energy of our people. Additional support is provided by Norfolk Southern, the Byrne Carter Foundation, the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities, and by the members of Blue Ridge PBS. Thank you. The following program is a high definition production of Blue Ridge PBS. Virginia State Parks. With over 70,000 acres of land, home to 500 miles of trails, beaches, and campgrounds. These outdoor retreats bring us face to face with some of our most breathtaking vistas, cultural treasures, and natural wonders. A system of 35 award-winning parks spread throughout the Commonwealth. Perhaps no other entity so thoroughly captures the essence of Virginia. From her majestic mountains, to her roaring oceans, and the lakes created by our own hands. This is the story of our natural and cultural history. Virginia State Parks, 75 years and still growing. Virginia is the first state in the nation to open an entire park system at the same time. We opened six state parks on June 15, 1936, but the seeds for the idea were planted a decade earlier. In 1926, the Virginia legislature created a state agency responsible for conserving and promoting its natural resources. Perry Bird had created a Conservation and Development Commission to, to help build these dreams, this vision for the future, uh, not only in the way of uh, creating parks and tourism here, but road improvements and all the other infrastructure necessary to move Virginia into the modern era. Governor Harry Bird appointed his good friend William Carson as the first chairman of the commission. At first, Carson's main responsibility was acquiring land to create Shenandoah National Park. But at a conference in Richmond three years later, resolutions were passed in support of state parks. Carson embraced the idea with enthusiasm. I would rather build a park where the plain people of Virginia can spend a pleasant outing and, and find pleasure and recreation close to nature than to build a great church or endow a cathedral. William Carson, 1929. But the country was sinking into the Great Depression. October 29th, 1929, Black Tuesday. The most devastating stock market crash in the history of the United States, signaling the beginning of the 12-year depression that sent all Western industrialized countries into deep despair. Unemployment in the U.S. rose to 25%, an all-time high. And in Virginia, workers, especially in the farming, mining, and construction industries were suddenly without jobs and without hope. There was not enough food, there was not enough clothing. Sometimes uh, they were thrown out of their homes. 
Uh, sometimes the schools had to shut down before the full terms were completed because there was not enough money to pay the teachers. Uh, children were, their hands were used in terms of work that had to be done at home or on the farm, probably to a greater extent uh, than uh, was true uh, before. Uh, just a difficult time. But it was during this time, one of the darkest periods in American history, that the idea of state parks in Virginia turned into reality. When President Franklin Delano Roosevelt took office in 1933, he went to work on what he called the New Deal. It was a series of initiatives aimed at pulling the country out of the economic crisis. He developed a bold new program to help put our young men back to work and preserve our natural resources. I propose to create a civilian conservation corps to be used in simple work, not interfering with normal employment and confining itself to forestry, the prevention of soil erosion, flood control, and similar projects. President Franklin D. Roosevelt, message to Congress, March 1933. It was one of the most successful New Deal programs, uh, both then and uh, his historically speaking. It did exactly what it was designed to do, put men to work, and it saved, you know, our forests. It protected our forests, our natural resources, uh, unlike anything that had done, been done to that point. The Civilian Conservation Corps was a work relief program that provided manual labor jobs for unmarried men ages 18 to 25. The program put to work half a million young men in forests and parks across the country. You would get up early in the morning, much as if you were in the Army. In fact, it was run by the Army. And you would have calisthenics before breakfast. And then you'd have breakfast, and then you'd be out working hard all day. And then you'd come in at night and there would be classes, educational classes, uh, trades classes, and, and the like. And so it was a full day. But there were three square meals a day and they ate well. And so for them it was, uh, I think, uh, a respite from perhaps uh, living in homes where the food was scarce. The men worked from sun up to sundown, doing backbreaking labor, clearing lands, building roads, digging lakes, and constructing dams and bridges. They hauled in sand for beaches, erected cabins and restaurants, and established hiking trails, all without the luxury of modern power tools. Um, the workmanship was exceptional. Uh, of course, they used lasting materials on all of the uh, projects. Natural rock when they could, uh, local timber wherever they could. Sometimes local experienced men were brought in to teach more skilled trades. And they were mule skinners, they were heavy equipment operators, sawmill operators, blacksmiths, um, stonemasons from the local area whose the intent was to bring the skills to build these parks because the whole intent of the program was to teach these young men that had no skills and were out of work from the cities of the Northeast a skill that they could take back home and use and become economically viable in their, in their area. Each young laborer was paid just $30 a month, and 25 of that was sent home to their parents to help jumpstart the economy. Whatever money was available, whatever job was available, was crucial to preserving, you know, uh, a person's will to, to continue to go on, to revive hope in the future that America could get through uh, this, this uh, great uh, tragedy. Because the program was designed to spur the economy, a man was generally allowed to stay with the CCC for less than a year before he had to move on to make room for another young man looking for work. But it was William Carson who convinced President Roosevelt to put these young men to work establishing state parks. Carson was invited to visit the president at his rustic retreat, Camp Rapidan in Virginia's Blue Ridge Mountains. When President Roosevelt asked Carson what he thought of the newly enacted CCC program, Carson said, I think the boys are doing fine work on federal lands, but I believe that they would leave a more lasting legacy for the nation if they were put to work building state and national parks. I will give you the men and money for your state parks, 
if you will demonstrate in Virginia what such a system would mean to the state. Carson called it the chance of a lifetime. Where did he get the land? He didn't have the first acre. He didn't have a dollar to buy the land. He started out looking for philanthropists, uh, wealthy Virginians who might be benefactors, who would care enough about the Commonwealth and her people to, to provide land that this model, this prototype for the nation uh, could be built. It took the Commonwealth less than a year to acquire by both gift and purchase large tracts of land for its first six parks. Those parks were built by the Civilian Conservation Corps. There were about 80 CCC camps in Virginia, with at least 100 men in each camp, a significant number compared to most other states. Virginia was obviously uh, just across the river from Washington, D.C., and it was nice to have camps in this location to which you could take congressmen, politicians, to convince them that this was a good expenditure of taxpayer dollars. of Roosevelt and Carson and the work of the Civilian Conservation Corps paid off on June 15, 1936, when Virginia opened six state parks on the same day, scattered across the Commonwealth. Carson's term as chairman of the State Commission on Conservation and Development expired, and he was followed by Wilbur Hall. The Virginia parks are considered by leaders in the park world to be outstanding examples of state park development in the United States. Their opening will herald a new era to the recreationally minded public of not only Virginia, but other states as well. Wilbur Hall, March 1936. The grand opening of the Virginia State Park System was a two-day celebration, June 13th and 14th at Hungry Mother State Park in Marion. Hungry Mother was selected because it was nearer completion than any of the other parks. A motorcade of almost a hundred vehicles brought distinguished guests from the train depot to the park. Governor George C. Perry presided over the opening ceremony. Our new state park system has been built to serve the working man. The working man is entitled to more than a bare existence and so it is the duty of government, either state or national, to help bring to him some of the pleasures the world has to offer. Governor George C. Perry, opening ceremony, 1936. About 5,000 guests and dignitaries turned out for the opening festivities, which included a concert by a 30-piece band, a water carnival, and a bathing suit fashion show. It was a delight to get to wear a bathing suit and go to Hungry Mother Park and sit on the beach. And I couldn't swim, but we'd wade up and down. It was just a great, great, uh, event for Marion. Later, there was a lakeside square dance on a specially built platform and a musical competition that awarded a top prize of $15. But the park herself was at the center of attention. The new lake was the largest of the six parks, and the cabins were equipped with electric ranges and water heaters. Electricity for those facilities was paid for by placing a coin and a slot meter in each cabin. The, the interesting part about the facilities uh, at that time, there was electricity in every building. There was indoor plumbing in every building, which at the time there wasn't in most people's homes. So this was one of the most modern uh, facilities available anywhere in the state were state parks. Hungry Mother State Park became known as the playground of Southwest Virginia. CCC workers lived in three camps along the Nelson River Gorge to create Dalpit State Park. The National Park Service used Dalpit as a test bed for other park designs. The park is almost completely surrounded by the George Washington National Forest and is known for being in the middle of everywhere. Fairystone State Park had nearly 5,000 acres when it opened making it the largest of the original six. 
It's located on an old ironworks site. And one of the first things the CCC men had to do was to run off the moonshiners. Fairy stone gets its name from the cross-shaped mineral stones that can be found on the ground. At first, some residents of Virginia Beach opposed the park because they were afraid it would disturb the peacefulness of the area. But the overwhelming support for the park prevailed, and today it's the most visited state park in the system. However, the name Seashore was never a good fit. Uh, but the truth is that there's no part of this park that's actually on the ocean front or on the seashore. It's all on the bayfront, and even the, the build-out originally planned would be all along the bayfront. So the Colk idea of seashore was that it was a placeholder name. The park was officially renamed First Landing as a tribute to our first settlers, though some locals still refer to it as seashore. Stanton River State Park was constructed in the Roanoke River Basin at the junction of the Stanton and Dan Rivers. The CCC men started working on the park before they completed their barracks, so they had to live in tents for a while. Plans for Stanton River didn't originally include a pool, but local residents wanted one so badly that they raised the money to build it, and it became the largest swimming pool in the Commonwealth. A CCC company of only a hundred men constructed Westmoreland State Park. This site was chosen in part for its proximity to Wakefield, birthplace of George Washington, and Stratford Hall, birthplace of General Robert E. Lee. From the park's Horsehead Cliffs, you get a panoramic view of the Potomac River. And on her shores, you can still find fossils from when the shoreline was under a shallow sea. Although the first six parks opened in 1936, construction on most of them continued for another six years. The Civilian Conservation Corps also helped develop what would later become four more state parks. In the early 40s, the state took over some areas that were originally used for farming and forestry. The U.S. Department of Agriculture turned them into recreational areas to keep the soil from eroding into the waterways. Today, the parks are known as Bear Creek Lake State Park, Holiday Lake State Park, and Goodwin and Prince Edward Lakes, which were combined into Twin Lakes State Park. Following several years of negotiations, the Commonwealth took over Swift Creek Recreational Area and renamed it Pocahontas State Park. It's the largest park in the system with over 8,000 acres of land. It put people to work. It, it helped provide sustenance to families. It taught young men skills that they would use throughout their lives. And I think it's perhaps, perhaps one of the best experiments in trying to lift ourselves up by our bootstraps, develop a great dynamic national program that would do good then and provide good long into the future. By 1942, the United States was heavily involved in the Second World War. With the draft in effect, the CCC was dissolved. Just prior to World War II, uh, these young men were able to take classes at night, classes on their days off and whatnot. So they started showing them things like semaphore, you know, the flag communication. Um, they started showing them how to work on wireless uh, radio equipment and communications, they had truck mechanics and all of the type of things that as the storm of war started gathering, they started to use these camps as training grounds. So some of these men went from here right into, uh, into service for our country for World War II. During the war years and even into the next decade, the park system saw little growth. The history of Virginia State Parks in many ways mirrors the most significant political and social movements of 20th century America, including the fight for civil rights. Until June 1950, people of color had no access to the park system. 
That changed when an African American named Maceo Conrad Martin tried to enter Stanton River State Park, but was turned away because of his race. In 1948, during an era of rigid segregation in the South, Martin filed a lawsuit against the Commonwealth of Virginia in an effort to establish separate but equal facilities for blacks. This legal challenge led to change. The state decided to expand its existing recreational area for African Americans and turn it into a full-fledged state park and called it Prince Edward State Park for Negroes. They were able to just pretty much expand the facilities and then build the overnight accommodations. The cabins were built, the campground, it had everything that a state park that was built in 1936 for the whites had. Equal was created within a restricted sense at this particular park. You know, if we keep trying to do separate equal on a case-by-case -case basis, we'll really never catch ourselves. It's like the dog chasing the tail. What we really need to go for is equal access. That is that everything that the state owns, every member of the state has access to. Prince Edward drew African-American families from all over the East Coast, even though it was never formally advertised in newspapers or magazines. Now, the word of mouth is an incredible advertisement, and just knowing that it was here and that it was available for them, they got the word out and they all came, and it was great. Right next to it, Goodwin Lake remained a day-use recreational area for whites only. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 put a legal end to segregation, but visitors chose to continue social segregation until the two parks merged in 1976. We're okay to choose to be with whom we want to be with. We don't want the law to tell us who we can't be with. Today, the combined grounds are known as Twin Lakes State Park. The state also faced a similar racial discrimination lawsuit in 1951 at Seashore, now First Landing State Park in Virginia Beach. There were public beaches in the community that were segregated at the time, and this was a whites-only beach, and there were African-American beaches also nearby. And uh, a group from Norfolk presented themselves at the gate, again, to then Seashore and wanted to gain admittance to the, the beach at Seashore and were denied access. But the trial was put on hold as the nation awaited a verdict in the Brown versus Board of Education case. In a landmark decision in 1954, the Supreme Court ruled that racial segregation in public schools was unconstitutional. At that point, the Board of Conservation and Development considered closing or selling the entire Virginia State Park system in order to avoid integrating the park. Instead of selling Seashore State Park, the board opted to lease it to a private operator in order to continue its policy of racial segregation. But the court saw through that disguise and issued an injunction to stop the lease. The state appealed, and as it waited, closed Seashore State Park on October 1, 1954. When Seashore closed, it closed to all patrons. And so in the maintaining of segregation, you actually harm everyone. And so it's the tremendous price people were willing to pay to maintain segregation that may have been what really forced them to finally grapple with, is it worth that price? The park remained closed for six years, but mounting pressure from citizen groups and the local press spurred a gradual reopening, starting with its extensive trail system. In 1962, the board voted to reopen the campground to both blacks and whites, but the beach and the cabins remained closed. After the Civil Rights Act was passed, the park refurbished its cabins, and the entire park was reopened to all people in 1965. We'll often say about segregation, um, if you look at it in relation to the way we live today, it's abominable. If you look at it in relation to the way we lived in the era of slavery, it's an improvement. So you've really got to take that long view and say, although we may have been stuck at a particular point in time in the 40s and 50s, were we as a nation, were we as a commonwealth moving forward? We were. Today, Seashore State Park, 
now called First Landing, sees the highest number of visitors of any Virginia State Park, with over 1.7 million guests each year. And the history of both Twin Lakes and First Landing runs even deeper. The CCC units that built those parks were two of the few African-American units in the country. The 1960s brought an increasing realization that American parks were not growing at the same pace as the population. So, in 1965, President Lyndon Johnson signed the Land and Water Conservation Act, which provided federal money for outdoor recreation facilities. Virginia used its money to secure land for 12 new parks. After passage of that act, it made a number of parks possible for us. Uh, Smith Mountain Lake State Park, uh, uh, Natural Tunnel State Park, Lake Anna State Park are examples of parks that were acquired with land and water conservation money. Almost all of our state parks, except for the newest ones that are in, in the process of being planned or developed now, have had land and water conservation funds used to build facilities in them. Uh, so it has been a great national program and that, that really got the park movement and the development of new facilities going in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. The CCC craftsmanship of the early parks provided a standard that the newer parks strive to maintain. Whenever we can, we want the appearance to be the same as it was on opening day 1936. Uh, we have improved some of the materials where we had to. We'll use, uh, uh, on wood siding, we use uh, western red cedar now instead of pine boards. It lasts longer, it's easier to work with, it's more stable, but you can't tell the difference from the outside. Uh, rock work wherever we can, we use natural rock, but where we can't use natural rock, we use uh, cast uh, stone um, concrete uh, that looks like natural rock, so that it's not an intrusion into the, into the uh, uh, visual aspects of the park. Roads, trail systems, visitor centers, picnic areas, and campgrounds were added to the newer parks. This, combined with the growing highway system, offered Virginians the opportunity to get away and explore. As more and more Americans could afford automobiles, they looked for places to escape noisy cities and reconnect with nature and their families. But 30 years later, the public asked for another upgrade to state parks, and the Virginia General Assembly responded with bond referendums, first in 1992 in the amount of $95 million, then 10 years later for another 119 million. This allowed the development of 10 new parks, plus improvements to the existing infrastructure. That's how we develop uh, new facilities in our park. So if you go and you enjoy maybe one of the new cabins across the state of Virginia, um, which the, with the wonderful fireplaces they have and uh, the great rooms and the lodges that we have, uh, those came out of those bond referendums. Today, there are over 35 state parks covering the Commonwealth, putting at least one park within an hour's drive of every Virginian. With the parks come opportunities for camping, swimming, hiking, mountain biking, boating and fishing, all while enjoying Virginia's scenic beauty. 2011 marks the 75th anniversary of Virginia State Parks, and more and more people are enjoying all the parks have to offer. Over 8 million people visit the parks each year, looking for relaxation, exhilaration, and just plain family fun. Mother Nature provides a natural playground for families. We live here and we prefer to come to the state park because there's so many different opportunities for the children to get involved in. And they offer awesome programs here constantly, so we love state park. During the summer we come at least once a week, usually here. Um, we almost always see dolphins every time we come here. And then on the other side of the road there's trails we can hike and uh, you know look at the wildlife, so we like hanging out here. 
and you never know what you might find. Now our children have just found the live horseshoe crab and this is actually their first trip to any beach. So this will be extra special for them. A visit to a state park is a chance to reconnect with nature. And believe me, there's never a dull moment that you can't walk on the trail and find something interesting to see or have a picnic or just sit out and enjoy the day. Whether you're on a two-week vacation or a quick day trip, it's a chance to escape the daily grind and explore the natural world on your own or with a park ranger. And so we have nature programs uh, about wildlife. We have uh, about wildflowers and fish and, and reptiles and all of the type of things that uh, people wouldn't have an opportunity to experience in their neighborhood. Um, we try to preserve uh, through uh, our special event activities, traditional values, traditional family values. Adventurers can sift for shark's teeth at Westmoreland State Park or pan for gold at Lake Anna. State parks have all the traditional offerings and the not-so-traditional offerings. And of course, state parks are made for water lovers. But no matter which activity you choose, the important thing is to get outside and get moving. Because beneath the surface, Virginia State Parks are more than just fun places to visit. They are vitally important to a healthy lifestyle. There's something to be said for recharging your batteries, for recreating yourself. Jobs are getting so much more pressure uh, associated with them now as opposed to what they used to be when, uh, when my parents were working. I mean, um, so right now, if you're having to sit in bumper to bumper traffic for two and a half to three hours a day, uh, if you're in a, in a pressure type job where you're staring at computer screens all day, you need some place that just doesn't have that. Providing balance in the lives of of our citizens, young and old, is, is critical. I think the, uh, the obesity crisis that we face as a country, the, the, the levels of attention disorders and uh, type 2 diabetes found in children, uh, all of that, I think, speaks to the need to, to uh, try to find ways to encourage families to reconnect with nature, to get out of doors, to, to get outside and, and exercise and recreate together. And there's really, uh, few ways uh, to engage in outdoor recreation that are more fun uh, than state parks. Our parks have made it a priority to connect kids with nature. Hands-on learning makes history fun for kids and meaningful. The kids who come out here for campfires and hear Indian stories can also see parts of Indian objects, pots and stone tools, it makes it much more immediate to know that, that it's really there, that it happened here, and this is the evidence that it happened. I mean, I could go on and on and on. You know, you have an opportunity here to communicate with your children on a different level, to communicate with your friends. I mean, you can learn about nature, learn about the beginning. A lot of archaeological things can go on in the area. I mean, you have... Um, you have an opportunity to learn and to be and to grow and to enhance your family unity in a great way. Yeah, we like going hiking, we like playing. Uh, where, you know, whenever there's a playground, they love the playgrounds. Um, we just enjoy it. It's, not, it's a nice thing in Virginia, all throughout the state actually, that we, because uh, we live in Arlington, and we love going to the different state parks and enjoying them because, you know, living near the city, it's nice to get away once in a while. And Virginia's award-winning youth programs not only put teens to work on park projects, but teach them life skills, leadership, teamwork, social responsibility, and of course, respect for the environment. They spend um, several weeks out in state parks. They're actually doing projects. Um, a lot of our maintenance on our trails are new trail building. 
um, that's going on in our parks. Um, maybe uh, help build a pier, maybe um, help work on some of the educational programming facilities. A lot of those um, types of activities are being done by our Youth Conservation Corps and that's an extremely popular program and it's been life changing for a lot of those young people. And we have outreach programs. We don't just focus on the park. We actually go out in the schools with, with kits and activities that they can get involved with and we're really trying to get to the, the children that are so focused on video games and sitting on the couch and really getting them back into nature. But it's the people who work in the parks that make each visitor's experience unique and memorable. You know, some people might get turned on by trails and mountain biking. Some people might get turned on by fishing. Some people may have never done any of those things and we've had a, we've got a, we've got a platform here to plant seeds in people's lives that hope, you know, it's not our job to make them grow, but it's our job to plant the seed. It takes a special kind of person to work in a park. The rangers share a special bond with the land and with one another. Uh, the park is such a part of the community and so many people, especially at, at Hungry Mother State Park, they, they have uh, worked here, they love the park, and so it is like a family. This is where I met my, my best friend. We were both seasonal employees here at the park uh, and, and, and we still both still work here. Uh, my wife Amy, uh, we met with, by working together in the parks and uh, eventually got married. I feel like some of the best people I know are, the, are these guys, and, and I, I really aspire to be like them. I mean, you you want to be around people you want to be like, and these guys were that way. Virginia State Parks are home to some of the Commonwealth's most spectacular scenery. As Captain John Smith explored what is now Virginia's coast and forests, he wrote in his journal in 1607, heaven and earth never agreed better to frame a place for man's habitation. Today, people enjoy her mountain parks and coastal parks. Parks that line Virginia's major rivers and her major lakes. She will show you her beauty any time of year. When new life blooms in the spring, in the blazing rays of summer, when the trees show their beautiful fall colors, or when the ground is just starting to shake off winter snow. State parks preserve our open spaces and in turn open our minds to the beauty and power of the natural world. In this era that we've been through with the rapid development of the Commonwealth and the loss of open space and forested lands, I think is, is a treasure that people 50, 100 years from now will say, my goodness, uh, thank God they were thinking about us uh, when they carved out these special places. The parks are home to all kinds of animals, large and small. Some show themselves in open spaces. Others stay hidden in their habitats. Like this bald eagle that carried his lunch into the treetops after plucking it out of the Potomac River. Or the elusive dolphins popping in and out of the waves of the Atlantic Ocean. The parks also offer access to the principal bodies of water in Virginia including our four largest lakes, Bugs Island Lake, which can be accessed at Okanichi or Stanton River State Parks, Smith Mountain Lake, Lake Anna, and Claytor Lake. You can connect with most of our major rivers, the York River, the Shenandoah, the Rappahannock at Belle Isle State Park, the James at Chip Oaks Plantation, and James River State Parks, and the Potomac River 
at Caledon, Westmoreland, Leesylvania, and Mason Neck State Parks. We line the Chesapeake Bay, and the Atlantic Ocean. Many parks also have smaller lakes, especially the early parks. Douthat, Fairy Stone, Holiday Lake, Hungry Mother, Pocahontas, Bear Creek, and Twin Lakes. They all have sandy swimming beaches and well-stocked waters. And nearly every park has scenic views of Virginia's beautiful mountains. Grayson Highland's outstanding mountain crests reach more than 5,000 feet into the air and have views of Virginia's two highest peaks, Mount Rogers and White Top Mountain. You get to come up here and just step back and relax, breathe. The air up here is just wonderful. It's the most amazing place in the world. And from Brakes Interstate Park, you can see rolling mountaintops for miles around. There are two rail-to-trail parks in the system. New River Trail and High Bridge Trail both follow abandoned railroad rights of way and are now ideal for jogging, biking, and horseback riding. But perhaps most importantly, Virginia State Parks protect our natural resources for future generations. False Cape State Park protects the fragile coastal environment between the Back Bay and the Atlantic Ocean. It's one of the last remaining undeveloped areas along the Atlantic coast. The, the nature of that coastal environment certainly makes them as unique as anything. Um, there are no other facilities on the open ocean like uh, False Cape. There's the maritime ecology of Bald Cypress Swamp at First Landing State Park. The trees there grow to over 75 feet tall with gray-brown bark that looks wrinkled and feathery needle-like leaves that spring from tiny branches. They provide shelter and food for rare plants and wildlife that also live in the lagoon. The thick canopy of trees at Caledon Natural Area is more than 200 years old. The tulip poplar trees in the grove are more than 20 feet around and over 150 feet tall. The park lines the Potomac River and is also home to the largest concentration of bald eagles on the East Coast. More than 60 eagles can be spotted in the summertime. Hikers can access the Appalachian Trail in two Virginia State Parks, Sky Meadows in the northern part of the state and Grayson Highlands in the southwest. One unique feature, we keep the road open year-round to Massey Gap, where people can access the Appalachian Trail, one of two parks that has access to the AT in Virginia State Parks. It's only four and a half miles one way, and this is the least strenuous, closest access to the summit of Mount Rogers than from any other approach. State parks also preserve our natural wonders. William Jennings Bryan called Natural Tunnel the eighth wonder of the world. This amazing formation carved its way through mountain rock a million years ago as groundwater containing carbonic acid percolated up through the crevices. Visitors can take in this spectacular sight from a chairlift that drops you at the base of the natural amphitheater. And you can still see trains running through the tunnel. Straddling the Virginia-Kentucky border, Brakes Interstate Park features the largest canyon east of the Mississippi. It's sometimes called the Grand Canyon of the South. Falling Spring Falls, managed by Douthat State Park, is one of Virginia's most beautiful waterfalls. At 205 feet, it's about 30 feet taller than Niagara Falls, although without the heavy volume of water. President Thomas Jefferson called it the only remarkable cascade in this country, though at the time the falls were 120 feet taller than they are today. 
Wild ponies can be found roaming freely at Grayson Highland State Park and are friendly enough to walk right up to you if you can find them. Most times, I'd say 80% of the time, guests can find the ponies if they hike up on top to where the Appalachian Trail crosses the horse trail. Virginia State Parks are a connection to our past, a visible legacy of the events and people that helped shape the Commonwealth. 26 of the 35 state parks are on the National Register of Historic Places, including the first six. A visit to a state park is a natural history lesson. It gives you the opportunity to know almost everything that humans have ever done in this Commonwealth, beginning 8,000 years ago with prehistoric Indians, who were really the first visitors to Virginia State Parks. We find artifacts from seven or 8,000 years ago on our trails, in our campsites. We've got oodles of evidence of the, the settlers, the colonists who came through. We have fragments of chamber pots, of French wine bottles, uh, English gin bottles, uh, medicine bottles for cough and croup and so on, which were left by, for example, the, uh, the gold miners. Sailors Creek Battlefield Historical State Park is the site of the last major battle of the American Civil War in Virginia. Stanton River Battlefield is also a Civil War historic site that preserves Confederate earthworks. Shot Tower was built 200 years ago to make ammunition for firearms of the early settlers. Lead from nearby mines was melted atop the tower and then fell through a shaft and into water below to form the pellet. Wilderness Road State Park features a reconstruction of Martin Station. The road itself was blazed by Daniel Boone in 1775, opening America's western frontier. History comes alive through special events, like this annual reenactment of the 1769 battle between the Cherokee Indians and the early American settlers. Chip Oaks Plantation has been a working farm since 1619 and is one of the oldest continually farmed plantations in the country with a variety of cultivated gardens and native woodland. Okanichi State Park is a window into the past and the Native Americans who lived on that land for hundreds of years. The terrace gardens allow visitors to experience the land as it was in the 19th century. Our commitment to protecting Virginia's resources and serving her citizens is what makes Virginia State Parks one of the best managed and preserved systems in the nation. In 2001, Virginia became only the third recipient of the prestigious National Gold Medal Award given by the National Recreation and Park Association. The award recognizes the most outstanding system for excellence in the field of park and recreation management. To Virginia, it means we're doing our job. It was a very proud moment for us, um, but was all, what was also unique about it is we were the first small state, and at the time we won the award, and, and this is, uh, continues to be one of the challenges that we face. We were one of the most frugally supported state park systems in the country. We were ranking near the bottom in terms of per capita support and proportion of state budget, and, and we're so proud because it's not all about money. Uh, money helps. Um, but it's all about what you can do and uh, the recruitment of volunteers into your program. Virginia has shown her commitment to maintaining a dynamic park system for a rapidly growing population. For the, for the past 75 years, I think Virginia can be very proud of the fact that, that we have held dear a core set of values in our state parks, in, it, in their management and their preservation philosophy. Uh, we're, we're a um, an, an outdoor recreational facility. We, we try to educate families. Uh, we appeal to families. 
Um, and, and frankly, I think that if we look to the future, it's going to be those same core values that will keep us going for the next 75, 100, or even more years. Virginia State Parks belong to our citizens, who in turn play a critical role in the health of the park system. Over 5,000 volunteers donated close to a quarter million hours to the park system in 2010. Parks also rely on their friends for support. Many parks have support organizations called Friends Groups which advocate for the parks. We uh, promote and help the park staff. We do a lot of projects within the park and we also uh, provide, a lot of times something will come up where they don't have the money for in the budget. Depending on what it is and how much it is, we will uh, a lot of times uh, provide the money. Visitation to state parks is at an all-time high. In fact, visitorship has doubled over the past 12 years. And Virginia is making it easier than ever to visit a state park. The kiosk at the office or the visitor center is available 24 hours a day. And through a touch screen, people could get information. They can print maps for trails. They can actually go on a little uh, virtual hike of what we have so they can kind of choose, pick and choose what they really want to get involved with. State parks are places where Virginia's natural resources are protected. They're here for our benefit. But it's our responsibility to make sure that they're here for future generations. Virginia State Parks has been very careful about erosion, and conservation of resources, which include not only plants and, and water and animals, but also literally the soil itself. So a great deal of the archaeological record, the bones and the teeth, the artifacts, the pots, the stone tools that are left in the ground that haven't been disturbed yet are in soil controlled by the Department of Conservation and Recreation. It, it guards the past for the future a hundred years from now or a thousand years from now. That's why the Department of Conservation and Recreation invests so much time and effort into preserving our natural environment. Right now, one of the projects I'm working on is to develop uh, long-range, uh, uh, we call them desired future conditions for our parks. Uh, what we want the park to look like in 50 to 100 years. We have to look and say, okay, what did this historically look like? And we just go back uh, and, and gain whatever historical records uh, that we can to say, okay, this is what the forest looked like, say, pre-Columbus. And we continue looking forward as the park system grows, even among the city sprawl of the modern era. There are six parcels of land that will become state parks in the future. Seven Bends in Shenandoah County, Widewater in Stafford County, Biscuit Run in Albemarle County, Powhatan on the James River in Powhatan County, Middle Peninsula on the York River in Gloucester County, and Mayo River in Henry County. We're kind of in the forever business. Uh, we used to talk about, well, you know, you build a, a building and it has a lifespan. It has, you know, 60, 80, 100 years that you expect to have it there. With a park, there is no uh, obsolescent date. Uh, we are supposed to be here from now on. The parks have grown and changed through the years, but one thing has remained the same. Virginia State Parks are as refreshing, invigorating, and full of life as ever. They're still great places to relax, reconnect, and get away from it all. I think we have big shoes to fill, and. Uh, and I believe that Virginia is up to the task and I think Virginians will, will be able to look back 70 years, 75 years from now when we celebrate the sesquicentennial of Virginia State Parks and, and say to those boys from the 1930s, job well done.
Virginia State Parks, 75 years and still growing, is made possible in part by the generous support of the following. Alpha Natural Resources is an energy company dedicated to respecting the land and celebrates the 75th anniversary of the Virginia State Parks system. Alpha Natural Resources, we power the world through the energy of our people. Additional support is provided by Norfolk Southern, the Byrne Carter Foundation, the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities, and by the members of Blue Ridge PBS.